your source for everything paranormal. Para X. The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. I now shall call. Live you must, and let to live. Fairly take, and fairly give. Do what thou will, if it harms none. By the magic of old, may it be done. Nine woods in the cauldron go, as above, so below. Welcome to Stirring the Cauldron on the Para-X Radio Network. And now, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, Mary Meet once again, and Happy New Year to everybody. Now, tonight's opening music certainly sets the tone for the topic of the evening, but it's not all kind of in a bad way and dreary. Um, but you'll, as we get going, you'll, you'll figure out what I'm talking about. Um, my guest is author Tomas Prower, and we're going to be talking about his new book, Morbid Magic. Now, Tomas is the international author of multiple popular books, both fiction and nonfiction, He's a licensed mortuary professional in California and Nevada, and he's worked for the French government as a cultural liaison throughout South America with extended assignments in Buenos Aires, Santiago, Chile, and in the Amazon jungle. He's currently living here in Los Angeles area as a writer and an author. And if anyone in the chat room has a question or comment, please send us a private message, send me a private message. And if you're not with us in chat, then pop over to paraxradionetwork.com and join us. And um, Tomas, come on. This is a good book. We have a lot to talk about. Hello. Yeah, I'm I'm glad. (laughs) I love talking about this stuff. So being able to share it with so many people is just even better. I know, huh? Well, this this is um, the book Morbid Magic. It's like the first multicultural guide to death spirituality and traditions from all over the world. And it's really quite fascinating. So how did your journey with death begin and lead you into working in the mortuary industry, which probably not, well, most people wouldn't change, choose that as a career (laughs) actually, but you know, it happens. Um, So I think, you know, it would be very eye opening on many different levels. Um, it, you know, I didn't choose it. It was very accidental how it happened. Um, I graduated from college. I got back um, to the United States from working abroad. 
did a couple other jobs, but I couldn't find like lasting long-term employment. You know, this is when the Great Recession was really kicking off, and it was just tough, and I couldn't find any job. And then there was a mortuary right across the street from you know where I used to live, and mm-hmm. they were hiring. And I was like, look, I live right across the street. I have no excuse for being late. I'll be here. I can take all the extra shifts. I'll be here in five minutes. Please hire me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then it was around that time I was also getting to the devotion of La Santa Muerte. You know, so I petitioned right. her. I was like, look, I need to pay the bills. I need to eat. And, you know, by asking this deity of death, surprise, surprise, I got this job in a mortuary. <laughs> you know? That'll teach you, yeah. You know, and it, it's a steady business. I mean, people are always going to die. So right. it's not, it's very stable. <laughs> and, um, you know, I stayed with that for quite some time. And I just seen all the backstage stuff. It's It was fascinating. It blew my mind because I never wanted to really, it was very, I realized what I did was lip service. You know, here I was worshiping this, you know, death deity, but <laughs> yet I didn't know what death was. I mm-hmm. never really got into the nuts and bolts of it. And when I realized what it was, I was like, wow. This is beyond fascinating. I can't believe no one knows what goes on behind these doors. I would never, ever choose embalming ever again now that I know what it is. And just all these, you know, mind-blowing instances. And I was like, people got to know this. And, you know, there's all stuff all over the world. You know, what is a traditional funeral? Because we think, oh, you get embalmed, put in this metal box, and then buried in the ground. Mm-hmm. Um that's very new. That's not what us humans have been doing. It we, loses the spirituality of it, the magic of it. And it's just something we've been doing since the Civil War. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, you we're know. newbies at it for sure. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and people are so scared of death that when it happens, it, it, you know, it blindsides us, which is pretty ironic since we know it's going to happen to everyone. Mm-hmm. We get in existential worries like, am I going to die? Is this person going to die? What about my legacy? So I just did all the research all over the world, you know, got people who live in the regions to contribute and put this book out so you know how human history, how we have dealt with death. And maybe it'll help you when when your time comes or when you have to deal with the death of another. Yeah, well, that's what I was just thinking that, that, you know, like it or not, it's inevitable. But I think that it's comforting to explore how others deal with death and, and perhaps take away some of the preconceived notions that we might have because I think we we all hear things as kids and we pick them, you know, and things stick in your head. You know, the worst things possible stick in your head. (laughs) And so, you know, having a book to to find out about all the different cultures and everything, it, it really was fascinating. I mean, on the cover, on the back cover of the book, um, it says that the book makes death a more approachable topic and helps us to understand and utilize the wisdom of the cultures around the globe. And, you know, that's really an interesting concept because I think I think it's human nature to run away from rather than approach death in any way. Do you agree about that? I do. And even even working in the mortuary, you see it. It's the it's the people who don't like talking about death that when you have to sit for the arrangements, they're they're just a puddle of emotion. They can't mm-hmm. function. They don't know what's going on. And then they end up paying thousands of dollars more because they get, you know, used that way. <laughs> yeah. The people who have asked the questions have like, oh, mom prepared her will. This is what happened. Dad wanted this. We have a set plan. Those families are a lot better because they've had the discussion of death and now they don't have to have the first discussion when they're doing a very expensive transaction. So mm-hmm. it, it helps to, it'll help your family, if not you. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and, and people, as you said, they take it in such a different way. I know um, when my stepfather died, I was fine with it. I kind of knew what to do. Um, and one of my bosses, I worked for a doctor at the time and I had to go in and make all the arrangements. He says, well, I'll go with you. And I said, okay, that's that's fine. You know, maybe he'll think of something that I'm overlooking or something. But here's this guy who deals with life and death every day as a physician. And the minute we stepped foot in the cemetery, he got the heebie-jeebies. <laughs> he was just not himself. And he couldn't wait to get out of there, you know. And I, I mean, I kind of <laughs> laughed because here's somebody that, that does know the realities and everything, but step foot, well, it's Hollywood forever. I'm sure you've probably either been oh, there or know it. Um, but, you know, you walk into there and he's like, oh, my God. And here's this, this 
guy who is the rock of Gibraltar when it comes to patience and everything and couldn't stand walking into a cemetery. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that that happens. I mean, even in the mortuary industry, you have to look at death from a very clinical point of view because mm-hmm. otherwise, you know, it it'll destroy you dealing with yeah. so much grief, so much death, taking it all yeah. personally mm-hmm. that you kind of have to step away and be like, this is a client. This body is, you know, a shell and make it very clinical just to get through it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, some people think, um, oh, well, that's cold. You know, they're not going to feel for, you know, be there with, with helping with what we might need because they're just too clinical. But sometimes you just have to. I mean, it, it's, it's an everyday occurrence. It, it's kind of, well, I don't want to say run of the mill, but hey, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> yeah, it, it's just, it, it's really, really kind of fascinating. And, you know, I was, I was laughing when you were early a minute ago talking about how we're really newbies at it because I had a question that I was going to ask you that, um, and I'll ask you again, and, and I, but you've already answered it, but I was going to say that having explored so many cultures around the world on a scale of 1 to 10, how well do we deal with death? You know, one being, I don't want to deal with it at all, and 10 being very sensible and understanding and even comfortable about the process. So, um, you know, I think, I think we've already answered that question. We're like, what, a 1 or maybe a 2 if you're, great, if you're generous? In <laughs> or, that yeah. We're definitely around the lower spectrum because what we do is when someone dies, mm-hmm. um, it's it's become you know it's very capitalist. You just pay someone to deal with it. So even when someone dies, you don't have to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Back in the old days, you know, someone died at home. The family took care of the arrangements. The family washed the body, and there's a sort of like grieving process that it goes through. And cultures mm-hmm. all over the world that have that direct body contact. Mm-hmm. They're able to let go a lot easier. But when you never see death, um, it becomes this mystified, horrible thing because it's an unknown. And, it, you know, here in Los Angeles, there's like millions. I want you to talk about um, the fact that some of the some of the other cultures embrace death as a good thing, something positive, um, perhaps even something to look forward to. Um, so, so, you know, talk a little bit about that, because I think that's something some things that people just don't get, maybe. But it, it's, yeah, it's a good thing. It's true. I mean, in, in a lot of cultures in all over the world, the uh, people have seen death as this great thing. I mean, it could be very, it could be a very tragic thing. If you look at it, especially in the, um, the United States, you know, the slave culture, they have all these gospel songs about how great it'll be when you go to heaven, how horrible life is on earth. That's because for a lot of people throughout history, especially in slave days, life was pretty bad. Life was very hard. Life was unforgiving. You didn't have all these modern luxuries. And so death was a sort of release from that. It was the time or possibly the first time in someone's life that they could ever possibly be free or possibly ever go beyond the farm that they had to work since childhood or whatever horrible thing was happening. I mean, life, we take it for granted how easy life is. Even with our the modern problems, life is so much easier now. But in the past, it was very very difficult, unpleasant. And so death was this magical escape, your first adventure you can get, meeting family again that you haven't mm-hmm. seen. And it was it was something to look forward to other than life. And even many like monotheistic religions, um, they see life as kind of like a testing ground of are you a good person or are you a bad person? Well, have your time on earth and when you die, we'll decide. And so a lot of people see this world as just testing. And so the real life kind of begins in quote unquote heaven. So for a lot of people, life was life only began after you died, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and and again, it would be something to look forward to. And and I think some cultures um, perhaps overthink the concept, and they spend a lifetime trying to get answers to questions that maybe don't have any answers, because we we only know so much. It's true. And in fact, um, there's a famous um, story about Confucius and Confucianism, where uh, one of the people, you know, goes up to Confucius and asks, you know, you talk about life so much and how we should live and how we should do things to be moral and upright, but you never talk about death. What happens after death? And, you know, Confucius just looks at him and says, look, if you can't understand this life, why are you worrying about what's going to happen afterwards? Focus on now and it'll take care of itself when it happens. I like that. 
Chris, I've always liked Confucius, so <laughs> that makes <laughs> that makes good sense. But, you know, I was really amazed at the scope of your research. I mean, you cover the Middle East, Asia, Africa, New Guinea, Australia, Polynesia, as well as the Americas. And, and, and it's not just a quick glimpse of each. Um, you talk about the culture, the deities, the legends, the belief systems and religions, as well as the magical communities of each. So, I mean, there's so much wonderful tradition involved worldwide. And, you know, again, when, when I was reading all that and then I got to the point about your comment about Western funerals not being really traditional. It's like, <laughs> oh, my God, God, we're so we're so behind, uh, you know, we're just, we, or we're not enlightened or something. But um, I mean, it, really, really research intensive. And um, that's what makes it so good, I think. I mean, I hope so, because um, if you leave something out, you'll the the reader will always be like, well, what about this one? Why didn't he talk about this place? You know, so it just covers everything. And besides, um, you, you can't really separate the spiritual experience from the human experience. So you have to understand the cultures in order to understand, well, this is why they think the afterlife is like this. Otherwise, it's just a bunch of random facts about this is what they believe. This is what they believe. It's no, this is how they lived. And therefore, they thought it would be like this afterwards. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I, one thing you did in the book, and I think that's very important because it's one of my soapbox things. I have a few. <laughs> um, but I want to talk about the warning in the beginning of the book because you make a very valid point uh, about dabbling in the dark magic of a tradition without doing some homework first and then ending up a victim of it all. And, um, you know, all magic needs to be studied before practiced. I mean, it's a continual learning process, as you know. Um, and too many people who think they know it all and don't need to study uh, will, without a doubt, end up on the short end of the stick for sure. And I'd like you to talk about the story about Dominic, please. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cause I, I began the book with a warning because it, it needs one. And a lot of people go into death magic and they think, oh, this is a new kind of magic. It's so cool. It's edgy. It's very punk rock magic. Let me learn it, read this book, and then do it because I need to smite my enemies or, you know, what have you. Mm -hmm. And it really came to my attention when um, back, one of my first books, uh, La Santa Muerte, Unearthing the Magic and Mysticism of Death, that was getting, I was really excited because it was getting translated into Polish. And we had yeah. to work with this um, Polish publishing company in my liaison, Dominic, um, had a lot of talking with me. Because, you know, things don't translate well, so they have to contact me saying, what do you mean by this? How could you say this another way? You know, helping with the translation as much as I could. And through that, you know, we became friends. We had a lot of constant contact with each other. You know, the book came out in Poland and then we remained friends and he by working on the book became fascinated with you know la santa muerte and death magic he wanted to use it but he, it was very cursory because he took a very intellectual approach you know being a man of literature and publishing <laughs> he took a very um you know very literary approach about it and not really getting into the emotion and the culture that it is in and i'm not saying you have to be of the culture to practice it i'm just saying you have to empathize and understand it he didn't do this. Mm -hmm. And his life started falling apart for, you know, non-magical reasons, particularly in his relationship. Um, and he says, I'm going to pray to La Santa Muerte to resolve this and use my death magic. And I was like, no, 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 that's not going to end well. Don't do that. You're not ready yet. And he's like, well, my life is falling apart. You know, I have no other option. I need to use this supreme primal force of death. And he did it. And um, what it did was it really... He got his wish and he found out that his wife was, you know, cheating on him for many years, had a lover, only stayed with him because he had this high powered, high financial position and he no longer liked what he was doing. And, you know, his, his whole life came apart and he's like, Damas, why did this happen? My life is worse. I'm like, no, no, you got ex death gave you exactly what you wanted. You wanted to resolve all your problems. Death took away your rose colored glasses and said, look, this is what your problem is. Now you know it. Now you can deal with it. He's like, but I want the fantasy again. I want to see life how I used to. I'm like, you can't. You are now seeing the cold reality of what your life is. Do something about it. Make some changes. And, you know, we lose contact for a bit. And then around that Christmas, 
um, I get contacted by his wife, of all people, um, saying, let you know that um, Dominic killed himself. And I was like, oh, my God. Life became really intense. And, you know, you know there's more to the story, but that I just realized that, wow, going into death magic and getting what – even if you get what you want, it can – are you ready for that? You know, you read this book, More, More Big Magic, and you're like, oh, I identify with this culture. I really want to practice with it. Okay, go ahead. Mm-hmm. But do your research or else you don't know what you're messing with. And it could hurt you, especially <laughs> when you're working with death itself. Yeah. So I, I like to give that warning just – just so people know. <laughs> yeah, you have to know who you're working with. I mean, I had a guest a couple of weeks ago talking about the Morrigan. And it's kind of the same thing. You know, you have to know what you're getting into before you jump in with both feet. And, um, you know, some people, I don't know why they think they know it all. But, I mean, it takes years to to understand a lot of these things. It's just not something that you read a book about and you're done. It, it it's not bad at all. So I just yeah, when I read that story, I you know about Dominic, I thought mm, this is the perfect story to to explain exactly what can happen if you're not educated enough to um, know what you're doing. Yeah, scary stuff, but but it's true, and I think people really need to understand that and 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 know it. Um, all right, so in each section of the book. Um, in addition to the information on the culture, the deities, the legends, and the rest, there's also, um, and, and it also has a unique cultural takeaway, which I found very interesting. So, like, the Christian takeaway is absolution, and the ancient Greek and Roman takeaway is owed to the living, and the Polynesian takeaway is holding the, uh, holding the dead accountable. So can you kind of explain what these takeaways are? Uh, that, yeah, that, it's my favorite part of the book, too. <laughs> um, it's Because, it, you know, when you read all this stuff, and it could be fascinating, and it could hit you in a very personal way, which is good, mm-hmm. you know, it's just knowledge. And, you know, knowledge not applied is kind of useless. It's just storing up and hoarding of all this these facts. What are you going to do with the information that you have? That's what's important. So what I really like to do at the end of each, you know, cultural, religious section is say, okay, based on what these people believe – about death, the afterlife, funerals, what have you, how can you apply that into your life? How can you take something that they're doing, their belief about death, to help you grieve, to help you prepare for death, to have you make it less of an unknown, or what, however you take it away. But learning something and actually applying what you just read is probably the most important thing in the book. Otherwise, it's, you know... Oh, that's fascinating. I'll save that for a story later, you know, and I'll be the most interesting person in this circle to say that. That's nice, but, like, what are you doing with the information to make yourself or the world better? That's what's important. So there's one for every culture and religion there. Yeah, and and, and, and then you kind of look at it, and, I mean, some of them make sense, you know, ode to living, yay, um, absolution, yay. And then I like the Polynesian one. You know, holding the dead accountable, and I'm like, "What the heck is that?" So, so go that's ahead and explain favorite. it to me, please. <laughs> oh yeah, that's my favorite one. I, when I was <laughs> doing all the research, I was like, "Yes, these people get it." Yes. <laughs> uh, always, essentially, like the the quick explanation is that when in traditional Polynesian funerals, um, you know, the dead is you know laying in state. And what would be like a funeral, you go up and a lot of people nowadays do these eulogies of like, oh, you know, grandma was the most loving, the most kind, the most whatever adjective person that ever existed. And the Polynesians don't do that. The Polynesians are very honest. They're, they could go up and be like, this woman was a homophobic, racist person. And now that she's dead, it doesn't make her a good person. And it's so true, especially in dealing with, you know, these family funerals. You hear about these 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 people and their stories of how, you know, they used to beat their children and they used to just run off and have all these mistresses or they used to be drunk all the time or they, you know, were involved in some pretty bad stuff maliciously. And, you know, they're there at the funeral and I'm watching the funeral and I'm, and everyone's just like, he was the kindest father. I know he, you know, he only hit me because we had to learn. Oh, he only (laughs) ran up with these other women because I wasn't good enough to him. It's like, no, just because someone died doesn't mean, you know, all of a sudden their sins are forgiven. 
mm-hmm. it's they're just dead. Mm-hmm. And to not glorify the dead as these wonderful people. If you weren't wonderful in life, you aren't wonderful in death, period. And I loved how the Polynesians did that. I was like, yes, hold people accountable. So why do you think that all of a sudden, do you think it's out of guilt that people will take, you know, really nasty people and put them on a pedestal after they pass? I mean, I don't, I don't kind of get it. Why do you have to be nice to someone that wasn't nice to begin with? Is it for show in, in front of people or, or I don't know? It doesn't make it, sense to me. It's tricky and it, it varies, you know, from person to person. But the most common thing I've seen, you know, working in the industry is that it, it's really tough. Let's say you had, you know, your parent and it's really hard if you're an adult and, you know, your parent passes away to admit that your entire life, this role model that you had, this person who brought you up was bad. And then you have to re-examine your entire life. You have to re-examine, you know, your natural instincts. Why do I do this? Is it because my father did this? Is it because my mother did this? And it's too much introspection. Am I a bad person? Am I continuing, continuing subconsciously this bad legacy? And no one really wants to look at themselves in a negative light. So if they say that, you know, this person who they're so attached to wasn't negative, then they don't have to examine themselves because this person was wonderful. Therefore, they are wonderful, and their family is wonderful, and their children will be wonderful. It's it's just easier. And when given a chance, people always go towards you know the easier thing to do, even if it's not the right thing to do or the wise thing to do. It's just easy. Well, I'm also thinking that maybe people are afraid that that if they speak ill of the dead, the dead will come back and haunt the hell out of them or something. You know, I mean, because you don't oh, know. Oh yeah, that was. Yeah, I mean, that part definitely stems from a lot of, you know, various religions where the dead were always wonderful because they could literally come back and haunt you. So you couldn't say anything bad about the dead. You couldn't because they were still involved in your life. If dad was a bad person, you're not going to keep bad mouthing him after he's dead. Now that he has supernatural powers from beyond the grave and is even more powerful, you know, it's it was a safety precaution in the olden days. Um, nowadays, depending on what you believe, it could be internal psychoses and, or it could be a continuation of fear of the afterlife. Yeah, I just, I, I have been in crowds of people when they're talking about somebody that's passed and, and they're saying that, well, this guy was a real jerk and this and that. And I'm like looking around over my shoulder, you know, because <laughs> is he listening? You know, I, I'm not saying a word because I, even though I might agree, I'm going to keep quiet. <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> You know, because you, you you hear all this stuff about, well, when somebody's on the other side and you talk about them, they hear you. They know, you know, and, and but the, the other side is they hear and they know, but they're not human on the other side. They understand a great deal more than we do here. So maybe they don't care. But it's always that juggling act when somebody says, well, that guy was such a, mm, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> okay, I'm just, you know, poker yeah. face because just, oh, yeah. just to be on the safe side. So, yeah, that's pretty funny. Um, I got a question from the chat room um, uh, from Cece. She says, can you ask him about the practice of sin eating? She said, it seems like the idea of dying without absolution was terrifying, but what about the death of the sin eater? I'm not too well versed on that, um, but based on, like, you know the comparative human history of it um sin it just it could be seen as good or it could be seen as bad because if you have that person that's taking on the badness of others it's very altruistic it'd be like someone saying don't worry about your credit card debt i'll put your debt on my credit card and i'll carry the debt for you it's like oh my god that person's wonderful mm-hmm. but on the other hand it could be malicious i mean people could be eating the sin to increase their dark power Maybe, you know, like necromancy, and they just want yeah. to get even more powerful, and they'll stop it from you. And it's it's kind of like a weird exchange where, hey, you know, you get absolution, but I get this in return. And it's like, oh, okay. But it really depends on the culture and how they view the the recipient of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, that kind of makes sense. But, yeah, how, how you know, how you are the sin eater. So that's kind of like, okay. 
you're doing it for everybody else. And then what are you taking it with you when you go? You know, everybody else's baggage and your own. It's, it's an interesting question. All right, we're going to take a break, two, three minutes. Um, so everybody hang in there and we will be right back. Away. There's more Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks right after these important messages. It's time to learn your real talents. Learn what to focus on, then change your perspective. Regain those divine intentions. Be empowered by what life throws at you. They are Psychic Little T and Jennifer Green, Nashville's astrologer. Tune in and discover who you really are and set free your passions. Get comfortable with the uncomfortable. Then you can follow your passions with renewed energy. May your journey be one of divine wonder to get where you want to be. Come aboard. They are Jennifer Green, Nashville's astrologer, and Psychic Little T. Every Thursday night from 7 to 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on Para-X Radio. Explore the second edition of the Witch's Oracle deck through 45 innovative cards and enhanced guidebook that peers into the world of the witch. The deck's stunning artwork has a new look and includes seven brand new inspirational cards. Each card now includes a suggested crystal or gemstone to enhance your reading as well as a magical incantation that provides energy, reinforces the card's meaning, and helps the desired message to be sent out into the universe. The easy-to-navigate guide also has a new look and offers straightforward, gentle guidance that takes readers through both good times and bad. And now includes a chapter on crystal and gemstone divination by the amazing Nicholas Pearson. The Witch's Oracle. It is a perfect divination deck for witches as well as non-pagans and is designed to suit both seasoned readers and beginners alike. Find out more about the Witch's Oracle deck at www.marlabrooks.com and you can purchase the deck from shifferbooks.com, amazon.com or order a copy from your favorite bookseller. Welcome back to Stirring the Cauldron. Once again, here's your host, Marla Brooks. Hey, welcome back. And my guest tonight is Tomas Prower, and we're talking about morbid magic. So let's jump right back in. Um, You know, the sections on the various magical communities, both historically and worldwide, are so diverse. And in them, you share people's spells and rituals and traditions and experiences from different places and religions as well as your own input. And that makes the book so much more than just a compilation of facts. And I just had to throw that at you because it's just, it's, it's really amazingly done. Oh, thanks. I, fi- I thought it'd be appropriate, you know, because it's a worldwide book. If you get other people contributing who actually live in the culture, that way it's not just me saying, this is what this culture does. And you just have to take my word for it. And here are the footnotes. No, you have actual people who like, are there in this communal worldwide book. It's just like the thing to do. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, okay, one of the things that I really loved was reading about the deities and the legends. Um, I was familiar with many of them, like Anubis or Santa Muerte or Lilith and Morgan, but was not familiar with a lot of the legends or the deities. For example, I always thought that Hades was hell. I love this thing now that I learned. Um, it was hell where all the horrible people went and where their souls lived on for eternity in the land of fire and brimstone. And then I read in the chapter on ancient Greece that that's not necessarily the case. Um, can you fill us in on Hades actually being like a three-tiered afterlife of good, neutral, and bad destinations? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the the kind of like binary of the afterlife is either really good or really bad it's a lot of christian reinterpretations of ancient cultures but the cultures themselves had all these you know layers of gray in them for hades in particular with the greeks um death wasn't a very good thing um in general if you died you kind of went to this very mundane very boring very blase gray place where like nothing happened and it was just like sitting in a waiting room for the rest of eternity it was not something to look forward to. 
if you were particularly bad, though, um, you went to Tartarus, which was what we would equate to as hell. It's this place of eternal suffering, and it's worse. And from that perspective, the the eternal waiting room is is annoying as hell, but it's not <laughs> hell, you know? <laughs> and But also, you could be up in the Elysian fields, this great, fantastic place where you got to live with the gods and it's a magical place it's it's paradise it's eden but you had to be this fantastically great human being you had to do great fantastic deeds you had to do things that helped humanity the one of the biggest ones is hercules you know and all of his labors and everything he did and he got this mortal that got into this fantastic afterlife and so it really made people if the default thing of, of your afterlife was kind of boring or worse then it inspired you to do something good because just being an everyday good person, that doesn't cut it in ancient Greece. You're not having a good afterlife. You have to do something worthy. And it really prompted people to go out there and try to achieve and be lo- everlasting and help their fellow man. It's really fascinating. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I all I could think of, if I think of Hades, I think of Dante's Inferno. That's it. <laughs> you know, just straight across the board, that's the only thing that comes to mind. So here, now we've got the good the neutral, the bad, and, you know, they, they have choices. I mean, well, maybe they don't have choices, but there are choices that are made for them, maybe. I don't know. But um, I also love finding out nuggets of information, like um, Cerberus, the three-headed guard dog. He wasn't gay. I, I thought he always wouldn't, you know, he was guarding the gates of hell and not letting anybody in. Um, but... But it's not he's not he's not necessarily there to keep new souls out of Hades, but rather he's there to keep people in. But that that was something new to me, you know. Right. And it makes sense because it's like here's this massive, savage, you know, guard dog. Yeah. And it's like, well, what is he protecting? Why are people so willing to go to hell that they would try to overcome this dog? Why do they need such protection of hell? No one wants to go there. And it makes more sense that, oh, no, he was protecting the souls that want to escape. He was preventing them from getting out. Ah, that makes more sense. It's so logical, but I (laughs) never would have thought of it, not in a million years. And, you know, I mean, and of course, then anybody who's watched Harry Potter, you know, (laughs) with the three-headed dog, um, the dog's keeping people out because he's hiding something. I mean, they're hiding something. So, yeah, so I just... I just thought, oh, what a good puppy then. You know, <laughs> he's doing his job the right way. But I just, who knew? And and so this is kind of the thing that I really like about this book because you, you pick up and open the book and, and you find little things like this, you know, little little nuggets and little things that you think you know about. And, oh, I don't need to read that. And then all of a sudden you read it. And, oh, shoot. Boy, I didn't know that at all. <laughs> and, um, you know, so many different cultures that that we don't normally think about, like Polynesia, for example. You know, we don't, I don't know if we really think of that as some strange, different culture. I mean, people know about the, the Aborigines and, and things like that, but, boy, they've got a whole lot of things going on there that, who knew, kind of thing. Oh, yeah. And, I mean, like in Aboriginal Australia, they have this thing which, you know, probably a lot of people heard of, like the dream time. And so they're, you know, the very boiled down version of it is life exists in this weird, eternal, not void, but just thing of constant flux of, am I dreaming? Is this a dream? Am I, is death waking up? Is this death right now? You don't know because the lines between what is a dream, what is life and what is death are blurred. There is no real distinction. So you don't really know if you're dead right now or if you're alive or you're asleep. And so it's this weird constant flux that everyone just lives in. And it's fascinating because if that's how you view yourself, that's how you view the world. The world is a very different place with that outlook. Yeah, I had I hadn't I'd heard about it, but I didn't know what it entailed. And it's it's actually rather mystical, isn't it? I mean, if if you have to put a label on it, I think. It it's true and it's just just even thinking about death kind of it affects how you live. I mean, going back to the the three tiered Hades, you know, afterlife. Mm-hmm. One thing that really interested me was when I when I was studying um, the Aztecs and you know the the Viking cultures of Scandinavia. 
it's that the way because you usually think you know your afterlife if it is different places it's how you are as a person it's were you a good person did you do good things were you bad did you do bad things but this one had your afterlife had nothing to do with your mortality with your um morality it was the manner in which you died and you know the vikings with valhalla you only got there if you died a warrior's death in battle so you could be a great person but you ain't getting there unless you died in battle so a lot of people, like, on their deathbed would, you know, try and injure themselves, cut themselves, so that, to, you know, quote-unquote, fool the spirits and fool the gods. of like, I died in battle, or I died from battle wounds, just to mm-hmm. escape a bad afterlife. And even the Aztecs, it's, you, kind of, you went to a very bad place unless you died on the battlefield. For a woman, the battlefield, you know, wasn't the battlefield, but it was giving birth. And so mm-hmm. it kind of prompted women to kind of constantly try to make babies and give birth. Because the only good afterlife you're getting is if you die while giving birth. So mm. all these women are like, oh, I don't, want, I don't want a hellish afterlife. Let me have another baby. Let me have oh. another baby. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, <laughs> and it's, it's fascinating because the way you do religion wasn't made that way to kind of keep producing sons for the Aztec army. Possibly. You know, what started what? Mm-hmm. And, one really, really nice thing I like about the Aztecs, though, was um, um, children who were born, you know, deformed or with some sort of, you know, mental retardation or something, something not right. Mm-hmm. Um, they were given a free pass. They would not go to hell because it was seen that this child could not be on the battlefield. This child cannot have children. Mm-hmm. Therefore, they should not suffer a bad afterlife. They should just they get a free pass. We understand mm-hmm. it's not their fault. And I was like, oh. Here's yeah. brutal culture, and it's like, we'll give them okay, we understand. I was like, that's very nice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, that that is, that really is. Um, there's a question in chat when we were talking about um, somebody escaping hell, you know. Um, so she says, well, if they make it out of hell, where the hell do they go? Oh, there's there's a there's a real good story in the ancient Greek section about uh, Sisyphus and how he escaped from hell multiple times. Really? And, oh yeah, like he he did it through trickery. You know, one of them was oh, I forget all of them. One of them was, you know, he petitioned um, Persephone to be like, my wife didn't give me the correct burial funeral rites. I need to go back to Earth and teach her a lesson. But what the gods didn't know was that he told his wife to not do that. So that he could go back, and this was all like pre-planned, and then he gets out, and he doesn't return. You know, and then death, the embodiment of death, you know, Thanatos tries to enchain him, and he enchains death, so he wouldn't have to go back and escapes again. And with Mm -hmm. death and chains, no one's dying, so that means no more animal sacrifices to the gods, that means no one's dying in warfare, all the gods are upset. Ares, particularly, is really upset, and he goes down. There's this whole adventure about this guy constantly escaping hell wow. and then going back into it. And, you know, now we know him as the guy who's eternally rolling a rock up a hill for being, <laughs> you know, for putting the gods in their place and outsmarting them, really. Oh, God, so he has penance. He, he's, he's a boulder pusher now, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, poor guy. Uh, but you got to give him, you know, po- props for trying. <laughs> I mean, it, it has to catch up with you eventually. But in the meantime, um, okay. Um, so, you know, you write about the various belief systems and spiritualities throughout the book and your own personal spirituality as well. Um, that overall, you know, you considered yourself eclectic. And I can understand that because in reading the book, I can see how, I could take a snippet from each one that calls to me and I could develop my own spirituality, my own unique spirituality, just from borrowing, you know, from everybody else. But you said that if you were pressed, you'd admit to leaning in a Taoist direction. So what drew you into that? And um, did that develop before you wrote the book or or was it part and, par- part and parcel of the book? Um, it. It was before the book, and it really helped me. Not because it's a, not because it's a way, a lens of looking through all these other cultures, but um, like real Taoist practice is essentially being okay with the unknown. It's the constant f- eternal flux. It's life is currently in motion. You know, of course, it's more in depth than that, but it's just rolling with the rhythm of life and knowing there are no absolutes in the world, and kind of just guiding your way like that, like a river. Um, you just go with the flow, and if there's a rock in front of you, 
You just flow around it. You'll eventually get to the ocean, but just don't take life so seriously. Don't take life so hard. Nothing has to be exactly like this. Just go what works for you at the moment and go on. And with that kind of point of view, I was able to, I think Aristotle or some, one of the Greek philosophers said it. It was you, the highest form of intelligence is to take a fact and act as if it were true without believing in it. Because everything is kind of subjective when you read it. But if you mm-hmm. practice it, you, un- you start to understand it from an insider point of view. And with the Taoist practice of, you know, I know that nothing is true and therefore everything is true at the same time, you can really go into these cultures. I mean, it's the the biggest thing everyone likes to point out with Taoism is that the first of the book, the Tao Te Ching, is, you know, the Tao that can be named is not the eternal Tao, which is like, here's this all-knowing universal force. And if you could pinpoint it, if you could give it a name and fully understand it, then it couldn't be unfathomable. Because by nature, it is so big that we can't understand it. So all these labels, all these names you put to everything, it's it boxes it in. It doesn't give its true essence. So just being okay with not boxing things in, just letting it be. If it's good, if it's bad, however these cultures worship death, you just, this is how it is and this is why they do it. And it's not, well, they do it, but they should be doing it. No, there's no shoulds. So it it really helped. And, you know, and I think when people read this book, because everybody's kind of looking for a path, and a lot of people have their paths, but maybe aren't comfortable with them and, you know, questioning, maybe I should be doing something different. And just reading the book, I mean, there is so much here to learn. And like I said, I could pick up something from each chapter and think, oh, this is great, and, you know, make my own thing out of it. And and I think that's kind of the wonder of this, too, because you're learning and and it gives you a better understanding of everybody else in the world to a sense. Um, and I, I think that's really important because we, I think we all walk around with blinders on most of the time and either don't care to know what other people think and act and, and their, their spirituality or their religion, or that maybe, you know, some people think that their religion is the only one and everybody else are heathens sort of thing. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Oh. So getting, you know, getting a book like this and, and looking at it, um, I mean, and, and just reading some of the things. You don't have to to actually just embrace every word, but things will jump out. I mean, I, I, I say this all the time, but when I get a book to read, especially for the show, um, things will jump out at me that, that I just have to go to right away. And and I think most people would see things like that um, if they just would read stuff like this, because it's so interesting. There's just way too many things that, like I told you in the beginning, we're not going to be able to get to everything. Um, but okay, so here, here, here. I'm just, I just grabbed the book, but and I just opened it up to a, a page, any page, and it says African diaspora takeaway, not keeping quiet. Uh, Talk about that. What, what is not keeping quiet? Um, it's because a lot of time, especially with our modern Western idea of death, it's very solemn. It's very quiet. Don't talk about death. You know, don't do anything. And by not talking about it, it becomes this unknown, and everything unknown becomes this horrible monster. Like the tribe on the other side of the hill is evil because we don't know what they look like. Therefore, they're probably cyclopses or monsters or werewolves. But once you understand, oh, they're just people. It's like, oh, so we're kind of the same. It's kind of around that where you go and you you don't awkwardly hide away from the conversations of death. You know, if you're if someone's going through grief, a lot of people get really uncomfortable around them. Like, you know, someone died and it's like, oh, I don't want to I don't want to bring that up because it'll remind them of death, of of their mom that just died, of their son. Well, no, you're not going to remind them that their mom just died or that their son just died. They know it's on their mind constantly. So by you keeping quiet, keeping distant and being awkward about it, you're making it more awkward. You know, just go ahead. Just ask them, hey, how are you feeling? Do you want to talk about it? If yes, be ready to listen. If no, be ready to not ask questions. And But by not purposely stepping away and not being silent about it, you allow that person to grieve in the way that works best for them and not just make everyone on pins and needles and quietness all the time. And it really helps, especially, and I've seen it in action. It 
just acknowledging someone's grief and that someone has died is better than just like pretending, oh, no, don't worry, that never happened. You'll forget about it. Like, no, no. Yeah, it's hard to dance around the elephant in the room. You know, it really is because the elephant's a lot bigger than you are. And, and to be able to do that and, and yeah, so it, it, it can be so awkward. It really can. And, and see, this is what the, the stuff in the book, I mean, you know, you pick a thing and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, you know, or like, like, ooh, corpse handling protocol. Mm, I'm just throwing things out there um, <laughs> because they're, they're, you know, there's just interesting things when you just turn the page. So what chapter, what area, what, what country, what religion was the one that just absolutely wrapped you up in a happy bubble? Uh, in a happy bubble was pro- <laughs> uh, the happy bubble was probably gosh there were so many but one that I really um, did enjoy was again that Polynesian one because it really hit home with me and seeing yeah. the hypocrisy of being in the industry and people doing that but I know that the one that like everyone always remembers and everyone always you know if they read the book it's like this is the one they forever remember and always ask all the questions about mm-hmm. it's um it's the stripper funerals of East Asia <laughs> yeah okay. yeah it's a very modern practice and it's essentially because there's there's the Confucian idea of familial piety you know the family is everything and honor is everything mm-hmm. and to have a big funeral is to give the most honor to your family you know if you dad dies and only close family show up that's dishonorous that's horrible you know our mm-hmm. modern private funerals are horrible to them so they want to get the whole village involved the whole everyone just coming to this funeral to give honor well not everyone wants to spend their day you know going to a funeral especially you know if they're in the fields and have to get the crops done well what's the best way to do that sex sex always sells and in china um they hire like class a strippers to be next to the casket you know doing their thing fog machines laser lights they go all out and you know yeah and you read it as a westerner you're like oh my god that's that's (laughs) awful that's so disrespectful and Mm -hmm. it really got me in my out of my bubble actually because it it really re-examines what our values because to them that is honor that is the best thing you can do because you're bringing all these people to dad's funeral you're it's a great thing it Mm -hmm. horrifies us just in the same way a private you know close friends and family funeral would horrify them and it really shook me into thinking well not so much what is morality but what is honor what is death what is good what is bad and so it definitely helped me in writing this book because you see all you can't judge these cultures from your own point of view. Mm-hmm. You have to see why they're doing it. And that got me in my happy bubble of because a lot of there's there's something not nice <laughs> things in the book that goes down. Right. Yeah. And it, it made that easier because it's like, OK, oh, so they so the people in the Amazon eat the dead and cannibalize them. Mm-hmm. Oh, OK. That's why they do it. That makes mm-hmm. a lot of sense. In fact, that's it's quite beautiful when I put it that way. Yeah. So it made everything yeah. mystical and magical and understanding. That I really and, liked. And it's true. I mean, some of the traditions aren't all butterflies and sunshine. Um, and like I said, you said cannibalism, sacrifice, all kinds of things are in there. But they're all explained and, and they kind of sort of make sense. And Kathy in the chat room just said that she's going to have to look into the book because it kind of wakes the brain up. Or at least we'll spin it around for sure. And that's true. <laughs> oh, true. get ready. Get ready. It will. <laughs> I know, it's great. Um, well, but we're running out of time. Oh, of course we are. But um, before we go, I want to give you the chance to mention your other books. Um, I want you to point everyone in the direction of your website where people can find out more about you and your upcoming events and classes and tutoring and all that good stuff. Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, the best way to contact me is on um, my website, which is www.tomasprower.com. Um, you can see what's going on, what events I have there. If you want to be more direct, go ahead and follow the Facebook fan page, Tomas Brower. I'm more active on there. Um, don't ha- don't look me up on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter. I don't tweet. <laughs> but, oh, um, you're not a twit. Okay. I don't, because, I, you know, it's you know my literary I says, I'm, I'm a writer. I cannot limit myself to these little phrases. <laughs> you know, I'm being real pretentious feeling. about it. Yep, yep. Um, but, no, I, I don't know. I just never liked that. But, um I'm on Instagram, but um, if you really want to get in contact with me, really read the books to understand, you know, the world and me myself. It's 
there's the La Santa Muerte, Unearthing the Magic and Mystic of Death one. Um, it's in Spanish. It's coming out in French. It's in Polish, you know, as we talked about, if yeah. you want. Yeah. Um, there's also Queer Magic, which is a real big one, which is essentially the similar format of Morbid Magic, when you go into all these cultures and all these different practices and spiritualities and religious beliefs. But it's the focus on, you know, the LGBTQIA people and where were they in history? What were their traditional roles where were they in the magic makers where are they in the afterlife and in the heavens so if you like morbid magic check that one out first and um feel free to contact me on facebook or my website all right i'm gonna feel free to contact you about a couple of things but um i'll talk to you about that later but in the meantime um the chat room is saying that you should come back so i think we'll talk <laughs> about that too so i want to thank you for very much for sharing your book with us all and giving me something really good and fun to read and as always I need to thank uh, the listeners also and I'm going to say that um, have a really good new year everybody 2020 looks promising from a lot of people's viewpoints so let's hope that's the case and until next time everyone blessed be and merry meet again good night Thank you for tuning into this episode of Stirring the Cauldron with Marla Brooks. Please join us again next week at the same time for another great guest and more Cauldron Stirring. Any rebroadcast or other use of this program without explicit permission is strictly prohibited. Copyright 2019. The Mysterioso March by Kevin McLeod is licensed through Incompotech.com.